Hello, I am Stephen. All my friends are synths. If you've ever spent any time in the kind of experimental electronic music world, then at some point you're going to come across a project that you either want to build to save money, like Eurorack modules, or projects you want to modify, like changing things and drum machines to add, you know, controls over the kick or the different individual sounds, maybe adding outputs to certain voices or whatever it is. And this means you're inevitably going to run into the DIY electronics field. And it's a bit of a dark path to go down. You go from being interested in music into something that's a lot more scientific in nature. And that isn't always necessarily the easiest crossover. It definitely isn't for me. However, I have spent some time doing electronics projects or failing badly at modifying different things. I've modified lots of Game Boys. I've kind of circuit been a few things. I've built modules for my modular system and all the rest of it. And so... I have picked up a bunch of tips along the way just because I am crap at electronics and the actual act of computing things and putting them together. It doesn't mean that I haven't discovered some useful things. So in this video, I thought I would share some of the things that I've found out, uh, some of them quite recently that have helped with my electronic DIY projects. Now, if you know what you're doing and you've already built your own projects before and stuff like that, this is probably not the video for you. This is basically some idiot telling beginners some handy tips that might help. But uh, if you do have any vitriolic comments, you can feel free to leave them below. Tell me how shite I am. Tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, etc. There's going to be 10 tips for no other reason than apparently YouTube likes these numbered lists. So I have fallen victim to the view generation machine. Here we go, the 10 tips for DIY electronics projects. Tip number one, and this might be an obvious thing, but if you're gonna buy components such as resistors or capacitors or anything else that you need for a project, buy more than you think you'll need. And I say that this seems obvious, but I myself remember when I first started modifying things and I needed like a 470k resistor. I would go into Maplin and I would say to the guy behind the wee component window thing that they had, hey, can I have one resistor? In fact, no, let's make it two. Let's, you know, be careful just in case I need more than one. Give me two resistors. And I would end up buying components in individual bits, which meant that I was paying like two quid for like a handful of resistors and this is something that I know that lots of people still do because they just assume well I only need one so I may as well just get one there's no point getting loads of them. When it comes to components you can get a few hundred resistors for the same price that you'll spend even just buying one or even on the postage of buying one. If you go to China for example AliExpress you can buy hundreds at a time for just a few pounds and this makes sense if you're going to be doing lots of projects, but it also makes sense if you think you're only going to do one project, because even if you think you're only going to do one project, you might get a bad resistor, you're bound to fuck something up initially, and you're going to want those spares. Resistors don't take up much room, so it's not as if you're going to be stacking equipment high. Like, um, if you want to buy resistors, but you're not entirely sure what values you're going to need in the future, and you don't want to buy like thousands at a time, then there are some good boxes you can get from sellers on eBay or AliExpress or wherever else, and you basically get a, a box filled with different resistor values, and these are superb because there's always some weirdo project that needs a different value resistor than you have. So have a look at them. The same applies for all components, by the way. Buy more than you need. Some of them may well be more expensive than others. For, you know, MOSFETs are more expensive than resistors, for example. However, you're bound to need more at some point, so buy bulk. Tip number two. Now that you have all of your components, you've got your 10,000 resistors or however many you accidentally bought from China, how are you going to store them? Initially, when I started doing these projects, I basically just had a big plastic tub thing that I kept everything in, wires and 
wee buttons for Game Boys and all the rest of it. But it was only recently that I realised I needed a better system than just having lots of wee bags within a big plastic box. There's loads of different options when it comes to organising your components. There's like craft boxes you get for people that do crafts and they can hold different beads and whatever crafty things that people have. But instead of having beads and all the rest of it, then you would be filling it up with you know, your LEDs and whatever else, and they're really good. They can be a wee bit pricey, depending on the ones you get. However, I managed to find toolbox multi-organizer things, and I don't really know exactly what they were originally intended for, but they were, these were like 15 or 20 pounds on Amazon, but I found them in my local hardware shop for three or four pounds ago. So I bought about, I don't know, eight of these, and I filled them up with, a whole bunch of good stuff, my MOSFETs, and you can see my different jack adapters in here, and you know, LEDs and capacitors and all the rest of it, and these stack up quite nicely. However, it doesn't really matter. Whatever storage method or, you know, box or whatever you decide to do, just make sure you have some kind of organisation, because it makes life so much easier when it comes to actually putting the electronics on your PCB and everything if you don't have to go rooting through a huge box to find the right, you know, resistor or whatever it is you're using. Tip number three. Now this is another tip which may seem blindingly obvious, especially if you've done any kind of electronics work already, but this wasn't something that was obvious to me, and actually I only realised this uh, about a month ago, but if you're gonna be working with these small components, it isn't always obvious what kind of component they are. And you can identify the component by looking at the markings that are on the component. However, the components are pretty bloody small. And if you're trying to identify what the text is to figure out what component you've got, it's pretty difficult, especially if you're a blind bastard like myself. However, there is a wonderful invention that uh, you can find called a magnifying glass. Now, I didn't buy this for electronics work. I had it for working with film photographs and negatives so I could see what's on the negative. And it just so happened to be lying about whilst I was working on some PCB and I realised, oh shit, I could use this to read the text that's on the capacitors. Tip number four. Now, if you're going to be identifying your components, you can identify it using the text, and of course, the magnifying glass is going to be really helpful with that. But there are other times where that isn't especially helpful or efficient. You know, you don't want to be sitting there looking at every resistor or every capacitor you've got trying to read the text on it or the coloured bands. And this is what I did for quite a while. Even before the magnifying glass, I would look at the resistors and I would be trying to read the coloured bands on each resistor and figure out which resistor was which value using the charts you get online. It may just be me, but I've found resistors, especially the blue ones in particular, quite difficult to read. And you know, the colors orange, red, and brown all look suspiciously similar. And it was taking forever to be able to figure out which resistor was what. One solution to this, to stop you having to read, the components or read the resistors, for example, is you can use a multimeter. And if you have a multimeter, you can basically attach the two probes on each end and it'll tell you the resistance value. However, the multimeter isn't perfect because it's a bit fiddly and if you're going to use the multimeter with resistors, you need to know the kind of rough ballpark of the resistor value because you have to set the range on the multimeter, unless you have a really good multimeter, so that you can, you know, it'll read it properly. And that was taking fucking forever because I was having to, you know, set the multimeter to a range and then clip it on and it was a pain in the arse. And then I discovered these things, multifunction tester. It's a TC1. These are dirt cheap. They're like 15 quid or something in eBay. And basically it's something you plug your components in and it tells you what they are. And this is amazing because you can basically, I don't know if you can see it on this camera and it doesn't really matter, but there are wee bits in here. There's one, two, three, one, two, three, and then some other bits. But you basically put one leg into one number and then you put another leg into another number. So like one and three or two and three or two and one or whatever. And it tells you what value 
the resistor is, for example, or it tells you what kind of capacitor you have, what kind of diode, and it shows you which leg is which. And this is, this is amazing. The other cool thing about this, with LEDs, it'll light up the LEDs while it tests them. So if you've got a big bag of LEDs that you happen to have chucked into a box and have no idea which LED is which, you know, I don't know who would do that, but if, for example, you had done that, then you can use this to pick out an LED, find out the color, without having to hook it up to a battery and everything, which, you know, you, you could do, but also that's a pain in the arse, so you don't want to do that. So I'll show you. I've plucked out a resist, uh, sorry, an LED that's been lying around, and I need to figure out what it is. Uh, there tends to be components everywhere here, as you can probably tell by my well-kept studio. So I'm going to put one leg in number one, and one leg in number two, and then you clamp it down. Okay, I don't know quite how well you're going to see that, but basically it flashed up green and red. And this is a bipolar or bicolor LED, green and red, and it tells you on it. How good is that? Uh, if you're using this for something that requires accuracy, uh, probably don't bother. But if you're looking for something just to quickly identify components while you're building something, or if you've got stuff lying about like me, fucking get one of these. It's great. Tip number five, I think. While we're on the topic of LEDs, if you've ever read any forum online regarding guitar pedals or modules, you'll probably come across people complaining about the brightness of LEDs in some module or another, about how blinding blue LEDs are or whatever else. The way you get around this problem when you're making your own builds is to use opaque or diffused LEDs instead of clear LEDs. The only problem with this is you don't always want an opaque LED or a diffused LED and trying to find them when they're pre-diffused is can be more expensive. It's a bit of a pain in the ass trying to keep stock of both kinds. And so there is an alternative way to diffuse the LED. And again, if you've done electronics projects before, this may be obvious to you. However, uh, lots of people may not know this. Basically, to diffuse an LED, which is clear, you can take sandpaper, and I think it's quite a fine uh, grain, and you basically just, you know, buff down the corners and the surface of the LED until you get a nice frosted appearance, and that diffuses the colour or the light really nicely. However, as a bonus tip, sandpaper can be a bit of a pain in the arse because it's quite hard to, you know, take the, you know, the circular surface or the spherical, I don't know what it is, whatever shape it is, the rounded surface of an LED and get it, you know, nicely diffused evenly when you're using flat sandpaper. If you can get one of these, I mean, if you can get one, they're everywhere, but uh, sandpaper blocks or sandpaper sponges, I don't quite know what the term is, but these are awesome because you can diffuse your LED down and it'll more effectively or easier because it's a sponge it'll let you get in there a bit easier and diffuse in a much smoother way so that's how you can stop people complaining about their retinas being burned out by your projects tip number six at some point in your journey through electronic DIY, you're going to have to drill holes for some kind of component, whether it's jack sockets to get audio out or, you know, um, uh, some other jack socket. I don't know. You're going to have to drill something at some point. And one of the challenges with that is knowing how to get the right size for the socket or component that you need when I started modifying Game Boys, this was something I was really bad at. Uh, surprise, surprise. And what I tended to do was just, um, let's say this is a banana jack socket. I would just hold up the end of it and I would hold up different drill bits next to it and be like, hmm, that's kind of the right size. Well, I'll try that. And then I would drill until I got the right size. As you can imagine, that was... A lot of trial and error. So I then progressed to using a ruler. However, when you're trying to measure something like this on something like this, it's kind of difficult because it's, you know, you don't, you can't always line it up properly and it's not clear if it's in between bits. Like, how do you measure, you know, 0 
zero five of a millimeter. I don't know. It's not something that I was ever any good at, and it caused far more stress than I could be bothered dealing with when it came to this stuff. So there is something called an electronic caliper or a digital caliper. And basically all this does is it's a ruler or it's a caliper, which I guess is a different thing. And it has a display and all you do, you put your component in, you fucking line it up and then it should hopefully tell you on the display, yeah, how wide it is. That says 6.7. I've not done it very well, but you get the idea. And this means you can find the drill bit or whatever you need that's the exact size to the 0.1 millimeters or whatever the value of your caliper. These are dark cheap, they're like three quid. And I don't know why I didn't just get one of these years ago. But now you know, learn from my mistakes. Digital calipers. Tip number seven. My process for soldering components tended to be something like this. I would sit in front of the TV with some crappy film or something on in the background and I would look out all the resistors of a certain value, maybe. Then I would put them all into my PCB through the holes and then I would flip it over and I would solder all of the components in at once. In order to keep the components in place, I would bend the legs out to keep them in there. Um, other people have used tape, but I would bend the legs. And it wasn't until uh, after a project recently, again, that I realized this was a really bad idea because um, when you're soldering in lots of components at once, it's really easy for them to fall through and slip through the hole without you noticing. This is how you end up with resistors, which are, they're not as they should be and they've had to be folded up. And um, yeah, it's not, it's not ideal at all. To get around this, there are a few different uh, solutions. Some people use tape and they tape the, you know, the resistor or the component in place while they flip it over and do the soldering. However, I found this is a bit of a pain because one, you have to use quite a lot of tape. It leaves a kind of horrible residue and you can't reuse it, which is why it uses a lot of tape. And it doesn't always hold the component in snugly or in the way that I might like. So. There is a solution, and it's in everybody's house in the world, and it's um, blue tech. Now, the cool thing about blue tech is that, I mean, the cool thing about blue tech is if I've just bloody discovered blue tech, you can stick your components through, put the blue tech over the area, and then it really holds them in place. You then sit it down, solder away, and then fucking just peel it off, and it works. The other good thing about Bluetech actually is if you're circuit bending things and you're installing a resistor, for example, somewhere that a resistor wasn't meant to go, then if you're trying to put it on a, a leg of a diode and something else, then you can take a wee bit of Bluetech and you can put that wee bit of Bluetech on where it's meant to be and hold it in place while you solder it. And that's way easier than trying to tape things and, you know, manipulate them in any place. Bluetech. Fucking brilliant. Tip number eight, and this is definitely an obvious one, so just fucking accept it. One thing that I didn't consider when I started um, working on electronics projects was the possibility that I might fuck something up and have to desolder various components at some point. For example, if I was to blow up certain IC chips, then this could be a problem because there's lots of legs in IC chips and trying to desolder them when you've blown one because your circuit was crappy is a real pain in the ass and it's really easy to bust your PCB by pulling up a trace or ripping a pad off or simply getting so annoyed that you smash the PCB into a million pieces. So what do we mean by socketing? Well basically you get something that acts as like a, a wee cradle and you solder that into your PCB and then you put the component into that and that means that if you need to replace the component all you do is pull the component out of the socket. Simple, eh? Yes, very simple but again something often overlooked. The most common component to be socketed is an IC chip because they are one of the most likely to blow up or burn out if you fuck up your circuit. However, you can socket 
anything you want really, so long as it's secure. Tip number nine, you should always check that your sockets will fit your components before soldering them into place. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, not all sockets will fit all components and there's nothing worse than feeling smug about yourself, soldering all of your sockets into place, thinking, ha, I've been smart, I've thought ahead, nothing can screw me now because it's all socketed, I just have to replace the components if things go wrong. And then realising that your MOSFETs don't fit into the sockets that you've used. Yes, this does happen. It happened to me recently. So tip number nine, make sure your sockets fit your components. Tip number 10, which wraps up this thrilling installment from me, is that if you're gonna desolder something, use something called desolder wick. And that's basically a bit of metal, I don't know, it's copper or something, but you place it over the component or the solder that you want to remove and you heat it up and the solder sticks to that and then you can lift it off. This is the method that you should probably use. If you use one of the gun things, there's like a, a sucker, I believe it's called a solder sucker. And it's basically like a wee quick hoover thing that pulls the solder out when you've heated it up. The problem with these is that even though they're quick and they're quite satisfying to use actually, they can pull the pads off of the joint that you're trying to desolder because it's quite an aggressive action for a wee bit of, you know, plastic and metal and all the rest of it. I unfortunately have found this out again through my many errors where I've desoldered things using the solder sucker and the force of it has ripped the pad out and then I've been in trouble. Using the solder wick takes a wee bit more time, but it's much better for the integrity of your PCB. Because if you ruin the PCB and you've come at the end of a project and you pull up a pad and you can't fix it, it'll haunt you. It will haunt you. So hey, that's it. That's my fucking useless 10 tips for people that have no knowledge of electronics and even less knowledge than myself. I'm sure that you will all have abusive comments. You will gladly tell me that you should never use Bluetack on a PCB because it degrades the components or that the component testers are a pile of shit or the digital calipers aren't worth the three quid you're gonna spend on them. Whatever that is, that's fine. I am here to learn. Please direct all of your hate into the comment box below and until next time, goodbye.